let's talk now about the Gospels. So um, this is uh, one of my favorite areas, and I'm teaching a course on the life of Christ right now. But of course, the, the difficulty with the Gospels is that uh, they are hard. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of difficult things to interpret in the Gospels, as you're seeing in parables. And uh, so they're challenging, and uh, that scares people away from them sometimes. They read something, they say, I have no idea, you know, what that means, what's going on. And so uh, I, don't, I don't know if this is your experience. My experience is uh, the vast majority of the teaching and preaching I have heard uh, tends to have been in the epistles when, it, when it's New Testament and uh, not very much uh, in the Gospels. And in fact, in one of the degrees I did, uh, our uh, exegesis courses, uh, where, which were combined with um, preaching, so you do your exegesis and then put it together in a sermon, um, the courses we had uh, were all in the epistles. <laughs> and uh, we never did the Gospels, which is a shame. Um, uh, just was neglectful. We shouldn't have, shouldn't have done that. So, um, but here we have courses in the Gospels and then in the Epistles. So we have two different courses, which is good. And your Greek classes. So, um, but there's a lot of hard things uh, in the Gospels and uh, the difficult things uh, to study. So, um, we want uh, we want to give them kind of a, some fair understanding and, and see how this. So I'm going to be on page 58. It's going to be the main page here. Hopefully. I want to make uh, six points, and you, you read this in my uh, book. I want to just develop them a little bit. And uh, of course you would expect uh, this particular point, that since the Gospels are uh, narratives, that you want to read them and take uh, big chunks with them. And uh, you you want to emphasize the broader context. And uh, this phrase is used uh, differently, uh, reading vertically. But when, when you're looking at an incident in the Gospels, you, you want to read vertically. In, in other words, you want to see, first of all, where you are in the life of Jesus. That's, that's, that's the first point. Where are you in the life of Jesus? What, what part of his uh, life and ministry is in focus? And then, uh, secondly, where are you in that gospel and the particular argument and emphasis of that gospel. So both of those are kind of the reading up and down throughout the, the whole narrative. Uh, both of those are, are really important. So um, that's, that's uh, uh, one of the, the first things to think about. And again, we're not uh, used to doing that, are we? We don't like to do that. We like to just jump in. I want to study this passage, and I want to get it now. I want it to be quick, and I want to, you know, I want a little zinger back, you know, pretty quickly. Uh, and yet, uh, things that you need to understand uh, take you uh, working up and down uh, the narrative and seeing that passage in, in its context. And uh, the point is, in a narrative, that not uh, all aspects of the narrative are uh, e equally important. Some of them are colorful and helpful, uh, but they're kind of secondary. And other aspects of the narrative are very important because that fits, uh, first, Jesus' emphasis in his ministry, but secondly, it fits the emphasis of that particular gospel. As you read up and down, read it vertically, you can see that. As you read all that comes before it, then you have eyes to see, oh, this is more important than that. Oh, I, this is probably the emphasis in light of uh, the, the theme and the flow of the gospel. So uh, this is, you know, this is immensely important, and uh, I just can't uh, emphasize this enough that that you would uh, read up and down that uh, uh, testimony for those of you that read Luke uh, two or three times. Uh, did that give you sensitivity to your Luke 16 passage? What kinds of sensitivities did it give it? What, what, what did you gain from that, from reading and seeing the overall emphasis of Luke and his 
presentation of, of Jesus? What kind of things did you get from that? What kind of sensitivities, whatever, to your particular passage? Could you see how this, this passage is not a standalone thing in that this is not the only time Jesus deals with this particular issue in, in Luke? You see that? Uh, uh, and in fact, it's a, it is a, an, an ongoing, uh, interesting issue from many different facets in Luke's gospel. And, by the way, continuing in the book of Acts. <laughs> it is an ongoing sort of an issue. So you want to do an interesting study. Uh, an interesting study is on money and wealth in Luke and Acts. And, uh, wow, you get an amazing uh, thing from Jesus on into the early church. Yeah. So what, I, I mean, what I caught, too, is that it was not only very prevalent, but that the degree in which, like, how, how vehemently he, his position was, it was not, I mean, Luke does not take a very, I say Luke, but I mean, yeah. when he's recording right. Jesus' teachings on this, was not kind of a, the right. Field. It's strong, it was, isn't it? Well, and you would have, I, I think you would have the propensity to want to, from the passage, look at it as a middle of the road kind of deal yeah. and give it some of the qualifiers that I was even yeah. alluding to earlier. But then when you understand, like, Luke's argument, that the whole thing, it's like, no, there, there's no qualifiers. Right. It's like, Good. It's okay. Okay. All right. Good point. So you, you know, you, you got that from reading you know, the whole gospel and, and the sensitivity of that. So, beautiful. That's, that's the way it is. So, okay, well, read up and down, get the big picture, and uh, even in reading it in a couple of different um, versions, of course, is helpful. Uh, additionally, if, if you have the Bible on tape, um, and, and you're going to be doing some traveling, or I even at home, that's a whole nother... Uh, means of intersecting with the Word of God to hear it and uh, that's uh, that's important uh, an, another way you could do kind of use your time twice is to read it out loud to yourself so then you get the visual and you know the oral uh, but there is something about hearing it it was overall written to be uh, heard by the vast vast majority of God's people so Okay, so you want to read it vertically. Where are we? So where are we in Matthew 23? Those of you who did that, this particular paper. Where are we in Jesus' life and ministry? Just a second. Yes, class? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work. Yeah. 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 He or she who has yeah. ears to hear. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> um, Okay, where are we in Jesus' uh, uh, life? Since we're reading vertically now, okay, where are we? What part of his life? Pardon? Towards the end, Towards the end certainly, all right. And specifically, obviously chapter 23 out of 28, okay, we're closer to the end than the beginning. Where are we? What's the specific setting in, in his life and ministry here? All right, uh, next chapter begins the Olivet Discourse. So, what? I'm not sure if he's there yet. Okay. Well, um, this is during Passion Week, isn't it? Doesn't he write into uh, Jerusalem in chapter 21? Uh, so, this is Passion Week, and, and uh, technically, uh, it's a, a Tuesday of Passion Week. S uh, Sunday, he enters, uh, and... Uh, it gets there too late, uh, the temple's kind of closing down, so uh, he can't, uh, can't uh, cleanse the temple. Uh, uh, Monday, he curses the fig tree and cleanses the temple, and uh, that's, uh, those are connected to one another in terms of, uh, of, uh, of fruitfulness. So um, we have Palm Sunday and Fig Monday. I, I don't know if that's ever going to catch on with the <laughs> liturgical calendar, but, uh, and, and so this is Tuesday, 
and uh, he's, he's teaching, he uh, uh, confronts the religious leaders and they confront him and then later on today he's going to deliver the Olivet Discourse. So the setting is incredibly uh, tense and, and passionate and intense uh, and uh, so then in chapter 23 on, on Tuesday that, that Matthew records, um, we see that in particular in Matthew's Gospel, written primarily to persuade the Jewish people that Jesus is their Messiah, that um, if he's going to persuade them that he's his Messiah, it will be kind of, in a sense, over the dead bodies of the Pharisees. In other words, he's going to have to uh, move the people away from their uh, attachment to the Pharisees and what the Pharisees have taught uh, because uh, while there's a lot of theological similarity between Jesus and the Pharisees that uh, they are resistant to his identity as the Messiah uh, and uh, they're resistant to his emphasis uh, on terms of a, of a, of a very holistic uh, connection of, of heart and deeds of the inner, if you will, and the outer. And uh, we see this early on in Matthew's Gospel. In uh, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, chapter 5 of Matthew, he uh, says, beginning of verse 17, I didn't come to uh, abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And he said, not the, the smallest a stroke is going to pass away. And then picking up in Matthew chapter 5, verse 19, whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and so teaches others shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And then he explains that. Verse 20 of Matthew 5, For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. So, wow, early on in his ministry, he, he lays down the gauntlet, doesn't he? That uh, this is uh, uh, about having a righteousness that is better. And of course, the people would be so uh, befuddled by that. They think, how can how can we be more zealous and more righteous than the, the Pharisees and their theologians, their scribes? I mean, they give themselves wholeheartedly to this and, you know, hours a day and praying multiple times a day and, and all the scrupulous things they do about the law. How can our righteousness surpass theirs? Well, of course, Jesus is not saying, in essence, you need to put in more hours per week than they put in. But he is going, in the Sermon on the Mount, he's going to reframe the understanding of righteousness. And in particular, he's going to connect, if you will, heart and hands in that. And it's a, it's a both and. It's not, not an either or. It's always a, a both and. And, uh, and so th that's right from the beginning. This is where he squares off against them. So if he's going to uh, win his, the people, the Jewish people, to believe in him, he will have to win them away from the, the uh, theology, the influence, and the teaching of the Pharisees. And, and that's unfortunate, uh, but that's, you know, the way it is. So what we have uh, then here in our passage is the culmination of this struggle for the hearts and minds of the people. And uh, so this is essentially then Jesus' final word to uh, his opponents, if you will, the Pharisees. So it's a, it's a culmination of that thread that runs all the way through Matthew's Gospel. Yeah, and... Related to that, we've been working on Luke 16 and the immediate context. Yes. Um, because in our reading, and you've said it here in class yeah. too, that from the point at which they accused Jesus of being demon possessed, yes, or, you know, in, right, under Satan's power, you said, and the reading, our reading also said that um, from that point on, he started to speak in the parables so that only his followers would understand. And he would explain, give them the explanations. So I wondered when I was reading at the end of 15, where he's giving the three parables in 15. Right. And obviously equating the older brother of the prophet right. son with right. the Pharisees and the right. scribes. Were they, when they heard that, would they have been convicted by that? Would they have been angry? Or would it just have gone right over... 
Because I see an intensity as he's getting sharper and sharper at them. Yes. And more and more harsh. And yet, it's at that one point where they wrote him off. You know, right. is that where he said, you're not going to understand any more of this at all? Or Well, I think it's, you know, it's a broad statement. Um, in terms of how much they will understand and how much they will take in. And uh, of course they could understand parts of it, the, the simpler the teaching, the simpler the parable, the more straightforward, the more better they can understand it, I think. Uh, I'm sure they understood uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan, mm -hmm. <laughs> that uh, sort of a thing. It's, that was pretty straightforward. I think the, the general point he's making is for the Pharisees and for all those who will follow the Pharisees is that teaching in parables kind of demands uh, some additional thought and insight and understanding to interpret it. And therefore, uh, you, if you're not capable of doing that fully, then that truth is not going to be condemnatory to you. In other words, it's the principle is, you know, we're judged by the light we're given. So uh, it, it is the parables are both, there's a twofold purpose, you know, certainly to teach, uh, to reveal truth to some, but to conceal truth from others. So it's kind of some will see it, understand it, others it will be concealed in varying degrees from them. And that is uh, both a pattern in the Old Testament and the New of God's revelation, but it's also there is a, a gracious dimension to it. If people can't understand it, then, uh, and by design they couldn't understand it, then, then there's a sense that they're not accountable for it. And there is, a, a, if you will, a lesser judgment that comes upon them. So I think it's, it's, there is grace on Jesus' part mixed into this uh, in teaching in parables. But uh, the, the Pharisees and their theologians, uh, I don't know. I can't speak for them. I would think they would be able to understand a lot more than, you know, the average folks in Israel. Uh, plus the, the rabbis had parables, they taught in parables. So parables are not a new genre to them. And there's a few parables in the Old Testament. So, but I, but I don't know how fully they understood it. Uh, but Jesus isn't telling it primarily to them or for them. He's telling it to the people and his disciples in particular, isn't he? Now in the case of Luke 16, they're overhearing and give a little commentary, don't they? So, Okay, uh, second thing is the Gospels demand uh, some background information and uh, regarding history and culture. For example, in our passage, Matthew 23, there's several little kind of things. Uh, beginning in verse 1 of Matthew 23, Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. And we go, okay, all right, is that, uh, is that a furniture design that they all uh, buy that particular line? Oh, this is the Chair of Moses line of furniture put in their house. Uh, you know, what does that mean? And so yeah, I passed around a couple of resources, Melina's book and then uh, the Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels. Both of those are helpful. Uh, and just then to understand, um, what is uh, this chair of Moses? And here's a picture of a chair of Moses, probably a little bit later from a synagogue, I think the one in Capernaum. And uh, I think Jesus probably means it at this point uh, somewhat uh, you know, metaphorically that they've assumed the teaching role that used to belong to Jesus and now they would argue has been passed on to them uh, and as the teachers of Israel but later on in the synagogues, they actually would have a, a seat of Moses. And so if a Pharisee was there in the synagogue, uh, would, would sit in that seat. And it literally be, it became you know, a specific uh, part of their architecture. But also then you'd want to, what scribes and Pharisees, some people see these as two different sects or groups. Uh, but they're really not. Scribes uh, could be in any of the different sects or groups, couldn't they? And the Pharisees and Sadducees and, uh, you know, the Zealots and the Herodians and uh, Essenes and all these, 
you know, or the different groups within uh, Israel. So you, you need a little background to understand who the players are. Um, verse 3, therefore, all that they tell you do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds. For they say things and do not do them. Wow, okay. And they tie up heavy loads and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. But they do all their deeds to be noticed by men, and then he explains that. For they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. You say, what is that all about? First of all, what's a phylactery? Pardon? Yeah, Robert. I was going to say the thing that we're on the forehead. All right. Yeah, where does that come from? Okay. Yes, yeah, they write scripture. Okay, they're little, usually little leather boxes, and, uh, and, and they would, uh, it has scripture in it. And it's from the Old Testament, I think it's Deuteronomy 6, you know, where it's, write it on your foreheads. Again, I think it's a metaphorical <laughs> statement. <laughs> Bind it on your arms, put it over your doors. Well, they did all, all three of those things, all right? And so, there's a, here, you know, showing how spiritual you are, here's a little leather box uh, tied around uh, your forehead or around your arm. And if you want to make sure that people can see it from a distance, uh, if they're not going to get up close to you, just make it larger, you know, broaden it, make it bigger and so that, I don't know, maybe it's almost down on your eyebrows, I don't know, uh, or, or on your arm to where it just, you know, really sticks out. So, again, it's, it's for people to see you and to uh, notice how spiritual you are. Now, in saying that, in a lot of cultures, people don't believe you're spiritual unless they can see it worked out in public. Uh, in the West, uh, to a, a large degree, uh, uh, kind of the tradition is kind of more uh, private, privatized and, and, and hidden and internal to a large degree. But in other parts of the world, it's very public. And if you're not public, then you're unspiritual. Okay? So um, it, this, is, this is a tension in a, in a culture where they are used to seeing uh, public displays of, of spirituality. But uh, it's not just the public display that's wrong. It's doing that to be noticed and seen by others. So it's the intention, isn't it? So uh, he comes after them. And, and again, you need to do a little bit of historical background work to understand and, and appreciate this. Also, uh, verse 6, And they love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplace and being called by men rabbi. Okay. Uh, place of honor in the banquets. Uh, what's what's the deal with that? Culturally, what's well? A lot of cultures, uh, probably most cultures, but some more than others, the where people sit in a, either a banquet or in the synagogue is indicative of their status. And uh, in Judaism, uh, their acceptability to God. <laughs> because uh, your status, if you have very low status or defiled or impure status, then that not only cuts you off from other people, but supposedly it cuts you off from God. And that's one of the teaching Jesus is going to come after and, and correct, of course. Uh, so uh, physical location in public uh, meetings and things is immensely important. And uh, the, there are places of honor. Now, th now that's true in, probably in just about every culture. But in, in some cultures, it's, uh, it's m much more honorific. And uh, it, it's, it would be a terrible affront for somebody to sit in a place of honor where they weren't invited, if it was, say, for a special guest. So um, they, though, uh, uh, love and seek and assume that they're going to be there. And in one of the other, uh, you know, parables, Jesus says, you know, wait till you're invited up. Sit in the back. And if you're invited up, fine. If you're not, sit in the back. Don't, you know, don't make a big deal out of that. Uh, and, and, of course, then the chief seats in the synagogues, literally the synagogues, were, first of all, they separated the men and the women. Uh, uh, but uh, the, the closer you were to the front and the center, 
uh, the more privilege you had spiritually and more purity and all that, and then it, it went out and proselytes would be, you know, kind of on the outer fringe, and the God-fearers outside of Israel would maybe, maybe be standing on the outer edge, who knows. Uh, but literally the location is a statement of spirituality and honor in that. So to seek those and to assume those are yours is, you know, is problematic, isn't it? Okay, so you, you, you know, it helped to understand these things and to, you know, be able to appreciate uh, some of the, you know, the cultural things that are going on here. That's, that's important. So, a third thing, the focus of the Gospels is on Jesus, uh, not on us. Um, you say, well, of course, of course. But uh, we can say that rather easily, but it's our, then our interpretive practice that where we get into trouble, isn't it? Because in our interpretive practice, we may have an uh, implicit assumption that uh, every passage is, is in some sense about me, uh, and so I'm going to see it, in li assuming it's about me, and then uh, kind of derive something that's about me and for me. I remember our favorite interpretive question is, uh, what does this passage tell me about me? <laughs> so, um, so, for example, Jesus calming the storm in the Sea of Galilee, you know, classic example, you read about that. Uh, it's, it's showing his messianic power, his authority over nature, but with uh, our Western glasses of it's uh, telling me about me, it's about how he wants to calm uh, the storms uh, of my life. So we allegorize it, don't we? And we make it about us. And uh, as one student one semester very insightfully said, well, if, it's, if that's what it's about, then the fact of the matter is, like in the story, Jesus is asleep. And, uh, and he's not even noticing the storms of your life. So you need to wake him up and get him on task, if that's what it's about. Of course, that's not what it's about. It's, it's, it's foolish, isn't it? Uh, but um, we want to make it about us. Now, in saying that, it's about Jesus and not us. Here's the, here's the key point. You and I, we can't know who we are unless we know who God is and who we are in relation to God and, of course, specifically in His Son, the Incarnate One. And so to say it's about Jesus is astonishingly relevant and significant to us. But we need to see him clearly and know who he is, just like you were saying earlier, Todd, so then we can know who we are and how we're to live and respond and how he loves us and cares for us and wants uh, us to live you know, a certain kind of life that is God-pleasing and all of that. So it's, to say it's about Jesus doesn't mean it has no relationship to us. It has astonishingly far more important relationships uh, to us than to just make it all about us and, and turn it on its head and take the emphasis away from Jesus and make it about us. So, uh, again, the more you can focus on understand Jesus, uh, the greater significance and relevance and life change uh, that will come about in your life and my life. And the more you will love him and you will see how astonishingly beautiful and uh, in some ways radical he is. And we have domesticated him to some degree, haven't we? And, uh, and so we want to focus on him. Here's uh, perhaps one of the most controversial things that I'll say is one of the primary goals of the gospel writers is to prove that Jesus is the Messiah, not to prove that he is God. Now, in saying that, is, did Jesus pre-exist as the Word, the second person of Trinity? Of course. He is an eternal divine being. He is God in three persons, and he is the second person of the Trinity. Now, are the gospel writers then trying to persuade people of the deity of Christ? Well, John and his gospel in particular will pick up on that because the synoptics don't have a big emphasis on that. There's a little, a little bit of emphasis on it, uh, a few passages, especially during uh, Passion Week, but by and large, the gospel's emphasis is that he's the Messiah. Now, in emphasizing that he's the Messiah, that includes his preexistence as deity. It's included in that. Uh, but because of the attacks of false teaching and heretics early in the church and all that, we 
uh, kind of invert that and uh, attacks on the deity of Christ, then we seek to read the Gospels, uh, and particularly in apologetic circles and that, seeking to defend his deity, approve that. Uh, and in, in evangelism with certain groups, for example with Muslims, we many times would lead with uh, uh, the deity of Christ, that emphasis. And uh, the fact of the matter is, even in John's Gospel, the, they're all seeking to prove that he is the Messiah. You see, people in the first century didn't have problems believing that gods could be involved in and incarnated and uh, interfering with or influencing uh, human history. They didn't have any problems with that. The, uh, the issue is, though, the important thing then, the Gospels are showing that Jesus is the only one anointed, appointed, empowered, authorized, and all of those words by the Creator God to reveal who God is in person and to uh, re reveal about God's kingdom and to uh, be given authority to reign and rule over that kingdom uh, at the Father's uh, pleasure and goodwill. And so Jesus is unique. There's no other name given under heaven by which we may be saved than Jesus the Messiah, okay, this person. So he's the Messiah, the long-awaited one. And of course, when you start using the word Messiah to talk about Jesus, now you're shifting the focus from primarily a vertical one of God and man. And of course, that is legitimate. And, and there's a few passages that emphasize that he is both. Uh, but for us to primarily read the Gospels in light of this vertical God-man thing is, uh, is distorting. They're more horizontal or historical. He's the Messiah, that is, he's the ultimate final uh, culmination of the revelation of God uh, in, in there's no further revelation needed. He's the end, that's what Hebrews 1, 1 through 4 says. So, uh, it, it, it's the flow through history culminating in him and uh, that he's the only one anointed, appointed, authorized uh, by the Father to bring about God's kingdom. Now, is he deity? Yes, he preexists as deity. But the emphasis is not on his deity, it is on his, he's the Messiah, the anointed one. So, yeah, Andrew, you had a... Yeah. Uh, you said that the idea of the divinity is included in the idea of the Messiah, is that right? And how... Oh, yeah, like in John 1, 1 through 18, the Word became flesh and the you know, Word was from the beginning and that, so, yeah. But, you, I mean, is, it, is there anything in the Old Testament that would tip off, like, the views of that time? That uh, uh, yeah. Chapter nine, I think Psalm yeah. Uh, yes, perhaps one of the clearer ones, and it's one that Jesus alludes to continually when he uses the term "Son of Man," would be Daniel seven, verses thirteen and fourteen. You know, he comes in the clouds before the Ancient of Days, one like the Son of Man. So, uh, it's not real overtly, you know, explicitly taught, but I think it is. Uh, implicit in, in, in several sorts of things. So you can see if you lead with that though, with uh, the Jewish people, uh, you, you would be leading with something that wasn't a huge emphasis in the Old Testament. Yeah, and so I guess my question is like, specifically for working with Muslims, the first thing that they're you know, offended by is that Jesus is God. Right. And so, and I have friends that work with them, and, they, and one of my friends, close friends is questioning like, how much do we really need to emphasize that versus emphasizing he's Messiah. And so I'm wondering if it's not completely explicit that the Messiah is divine. I guess my question is, can you just believe he's the Messiah and the Savior and be saved? <laughs> wow. Um, essentially then, here's your new word for the day, you would be a Benetarian as opposed to a Trinitarian. Uh, and, and it's the same thing, can, can people believe that Jesus wasn't divine uh, and be saved uh, in this country? I've had phone calls from folks about that. Uh, they believe God uh, exists and God's spirit. Uh, so, you know, there's uh, two persons perhaps of the Godhead, but would not believe that Jesus is a part of that. Um, I've, I would, just to be safe, I would say no. I don't think that you could be a, a become a true believer in in, uh, in Jesus if you 
didn't include his deity. And what I was trying to say is don't lead with the deity issue, but uh, work to prove his messianic identity. And, and then uh, later on in the discussion, uh, say that now as a part of that is his pre-existence as deity, as John's gospel emphasizes that more than the synoptics. And, but, but if you lead with that, it just, it, it's a shutdown, it seems like. So, and it's not true to the gospel's emphasis. Now you say, how can you say that the gospels are emphasizing Jesus as the Messiah? Well, two huge incidents. Uh, the first one is uh, when the Pharisees reject him and, and look at his words and deeds and they say they're of the devil. And he said, uh, you've committed the unpardonable sin. Uh, uh, every sin against the Son of Man can be forgiven, but this is a sin against the Holy Spirit. So his point is, everything I'm doing is not an expression of my deity, but it's the expression of uh, the Holy Spirit who empowers me because I am the anointed one. That's what Christ or Messiah means, Mashiach in Hebrew. I'm the anointed one, and I do these works and deeds in the power of the Holy Spirit so that you can see that I'm the anointed one. So if you reject the words and the deeds and all that, you are rejecting the work and, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit on me, and you are sinning against the Holy Spirit. Now, that's the fundamental rejection of Jesus, isn't it? To reject his messianic identity as the anointed one. And, and additionally then, when he, with his disciples, when he gets at about the three-year mark, he asks, who do the people say that I am? Oh, one of the prophets, John the Baptist, you know, resurrected. Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Okay, he said, you're absolutely right. So you see that what he was wanting to elicit from his disciples is he's the Messiah. Now again, I think that includes his un understanding, his preexistence as deity. I think that's a part of it. I, and I'm not sure one can be a true believer and, and, and leave that aspect out. But again, I just, what the Holy Spirit is convincing people of is that Jesus is the Messiah. And if we want to cooperate with that and with the emphasis of the Gospels, we need to emphasize that. So, yeah, somebody taught it to do. Was it common in first century Judaism to expect that the Messiah, or whatever, because they did expect the Messiah to be coming around early in that century, and was it in their expectation that he would be divine? Not necessarily. There's some, some evidences of that in, in Qumran literature among the, apparently the Essenes. But no, it's not a huge, uh, not a huge emphasis. Yeah. Right. Well, certainly the Pharisees. Uh, one of the great offenses was he's claiming to be equal, you know, with God, uh, and they consider that heretical. So if they expected the Messiah to have be deity, a God-man, then that shouldn't have been that difficult and offensive to them. In fact, they should have expected him to say that. So, at least within the Pharisaism, no, probably that wasn't a big part of it. So then a follow-up question, I mean, that, that would seem like then, if that wasn't commonplace to expect that, I mean, that would seem like a strong argument, like you'd want to really put that in your gospel. And I, John, I think John actually does it profoundly, but yes. Uh, it is, it is, it, it is in the synoptic, especially later on, but it's, it's not on the front end and it's not a drum that gets loudly banged. And, and, but it is a part of Jesus' identity, of course. And John writing, in a sense, to supplement and complement the synoptics, then moves it right to the front of his gospel in his prologue. But again, even there, it's the word, you know, he was God, he was with God, he's there at creation. Uh, but the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So within less than 10 verses, you know, we're, we're at the incarnation and, and moving on. So it, it, it's, yeah, he, he makes it clear it's a both and. But then the rest of his gospel is uh, primarily emphasizing Jesus' messianic identity with a, a few other passages about his preexistence as deity. But it's, again, the bulk of it, the main thrust of it is messianic. So... Yes. Are there any yeah. Uh, previous writings or any records that because this uh, real Messiah from, from G 
Jews and from uh, the Gospels are actually trying to say totally different. And I'm trying to, trying to think that, so then what type of a Messiah the Jews were expecting? Like, were there any writings, any chants, or any hymns, or any praises, or any imagination that actually brought? Because they were expecting the Messiah based on Torah, right? Based right. on Torah, they were expecting. Right. And Well, uh, probably the clearest thing I could say is that they were expecting s uh, someone like Moses because Moses said, there's going to come a prophet, someone like me, listen to him. So one of the emphases in John's gospel and somewhat in Acts is that Jesus is the second Moses and that's a part of a messianic identity. Uh, so uh, they should have, uh, y y you know, pick that up, uh, but again, there's not a big emphasis on deity, you know, in that. Uh, again, probably one of the best passages is uh, one like the Son of Man comes in the clouds before the Ancient of Days. And so Jesus' favorite designation, self-designation, is Son of Man. And uh, one of the passages that should come to your mind, it would be Daniel 7, 13 and 14 for a Jewish person. And, uh, and, and so they should then at least it raise the, the possibility, oh wow, if he's coming in the clouds, that's what God does. God comes in the clouds, that's not what human beings do. Um, so, yeah, again, it's not, uh, not a huge emphasis on the Old Testament on this, but it becomes, uh, you know, clearer. It, it's, it's, that's why it's not a huge emphasis in the Gospels. So that's all I'm saying. It's don't cut it out, but don't primarily lead with it. And don't think Jesus in his miracles, and this is the second point, this is on page 28. Uh, don't think Jesus is toggling back and forth when he does miracles between deity and humanity. You know, kind of, okay, it's time for a miracle, it's time to you know, shift into my deity, you know, side, okay, now that's over, okay, and just shift back into my humanity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, he's, he's doing it as the God-man, as one coherent person. And again, in his incarnation, there's an astonishing self-humbling, Philippians 2, 5 through 11 speaks about. He didn't consider equality with God a thing to be grasped but he emptied himself. Metaphorical language, not of his deity, of course, but of his status and, and, and that. And so he's entrusted himself to the Father to do the will of the Father, to not say or do anything but what the Father tells him. And everything he says and does, he does in the power and uh, reliance upon the Holy Spirit. So to reject what he says and does is to reject the working of the Holy Spirit and him as the anointed one. So his miracles, all of these, are not expressions of his deity, but they are expressions of his messianic identity. And when he does these, all of his miracles can be uh, divided into these nine categories. And basically what they're saying is, and he's tipping his messianic hand. He's saying, this is who I am, and I can bring about God's kingdom. I can bring it about what the prophet said in all of these nine areas. I am that person. I can do that. I can bring that about. I am he, I'm the anointed one, I'm the Messiah. I'm the only one authorized to bring about God's kingdom on earth. And uh, so that's the purpose uh, of these miracles. And uh, I know it sounds strange to you, but I, I think it's much uh, wiser, better, and more appropriate to read the, the New Testament in this way. So, yeah, Tyler. Because isn't that even what Jesus says in response to um, John the Baptist sending the guys while well, he's in right. jail. He said, hey, are you the one that we expect? And, right. And he could just say yes, but he said, he points to the fact that he's fulfilling the messianic right. miracles. Yeah. He gives him a, some quote right out of Isaiah 35, verse 5 and 6 there, yes, about the, the deaf hear, the dumb speak, the lame, you know, walk and that. So, absolutely. Okay, we read them vertically, the Gospels, but we also read them horizontally and we compare the different gospel accounts. Now, generally, there's not uh, many incidents where you can compare all four gospels. The vast majority of them are three. For example, our passage, Matthew 23, 1 to 12. In the uh, first part of it, obviously, Matthew gives 12 verses 
Mark gives uh, th three and a half. I'm on page 59 now. Mark gives three and a half, and Luke gives three. So this was not a huge uh, uh, issue to Mark's readers, apparently uh, Roman, uh, Gentile readers, and or to Luke, apparently more Greek-oriented readers. Uh, the issue with the Pharisees uh, was not a huge issue to them because they hadn't necessarily been under the authority and the teaching of the Pharisee, their influence. But Matthew gives initially 12, and then the discourse just keeps going on, doesn't it? Uh, up through uh, verse 36, and then we have the lament over Jerusalem uh, uh, up through verse 39. So uh, this is a huge issue to Matthew's readers, to the Jewish people. And so by comparing the Gospels with one another, reading horizontally, you can see the unique emphasis of each of the Gospels. And that's the purpose of this. Now, when you're teaching a Gospel passage, I don't think it's appropriate to poach off of one of the other Gospels, okay? Don't, if you're in Mark, don't say, but now uh, in Luke we know this, and in Matthew we know that. Well, if those were significant to Mark's account, he would have included those things, okay? So, teach uh, the incidents within the Gospels as in light of what the Gospels do mention and what they do emphasize. And to be careful from drawing from the others. Um, so there, there's, there's really great value in this to, in terms of seeing the emphasis of each Gospel. So, and that's what uh, having... Why is that a problem to do that if they're talking about the same story? Well, if it's just a, 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 a fact the grass was green, okay, uh, and you can draw that in, but to if it if it changes the emphasis, uh, uh, because the gospel writers can use the same incident in you know a couple of different ways, and so if you're drawing from the other one and it subtly shifts and change the focus and the emphasis of Mark by drawing stuff from Luke, then you're, you're missing Mark's point. Okay. Yeah, you're missing Mark's point. So you just want to be, you know, want to be careful on that. Yeah. And Are there sometimes maybe when doing like a topical study or something where you, could, where it'd be appropriate just to use like kind of the historical Jesus that we get from all of the Gospels in the Old Testament sure. to teach sure. points from his life and what he did. Yeah, absolutely. If you're doing a topical thing or a theological thing, you know, everything's fair game, um, and that's different from just expositing, you know, one passage. So absolutely. Although it's, it's interesting in teaching through the life of Christ where we're going <laughs> uh, in between usually two or three gospel accounts, it's a little bit frustrating to me because uh, we're kind of homogenizing each of the accounts and, and kind of neutralizing their unique emphasis uh, when we do that. We're just looking at it kind of all together. So it's, um, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, it's not wrong to study that way, but it, it, does, uh, it doesn't seem to be as powerful, I, I think, in terms of bringing out the author's points. Okay, last point here, and then we want to talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, our passage a little bit more. Understand the centrality of the kingdom of God in the Gospels, and I'm suggesting it's an already not yet. Now, on uh, page 60, uh, the top part, you have uh, this part of the Jewish understanding of the kingdom, and this is what the Old Testament taught, this is what John the Baptist taught and expected, is that you have this present evil age under the, the power of uh, the devil, then the Messiah comes and the Messianic age begins, pretty straightforward. And uh, the kingdom is restored to Israel and all of that, and that's what Disciples ask him in Acts 1, 6, Lord, this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel. You're the Messiah, and uh, you're, you're going to reign and rule, and so that's what you're going to do. But it's, of course, a, l a little more complicated than that. And here's where the theological systems uh, differ uh, a bit between one another. And uh, I'm suggesting, and my posture would be as a, what's called a progressive dispensationalist, uh, I believe, uh, just through my own study and then looking at others, that uh, in his first coming, that, that Jesus inaugurated the kingdom of God. It began, but it began in an unexpected form. And uh, that unexpected form is essentially a harvest form of going out among the people groups of the world and making uh, disciples for Jesus among them. 
And uh, I think that's the, the primary focus uh, of this age. Now, when um, he returns, I think we will get the expected, prophesied, anticipated form of the, that the Old Testament said was going to happen, that, that that will happen at that time. So it isn't already, it is here in an unexpected form, but it is not yet. And so maybe you're saying, well, how can you say the kingdom of God is here? Well, I think the, the main evidence is uh, that we have the, the two eschatological or end of the age gifts that uh, were promised about the new covenant in Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36. Uh, first of all is that righteousness is given, uh, imputed righteousness of Messiah to us through, by faith, and uh, secondly that the Holy Spirit is given. Uh, and the anointed one, the Old Testament said, uh, there were passages that he would anoint his people. With the, he's anointed with the Spirit and he will anoint his people. Spirit. And so on the day of Pentecost, uh, Peter says uh, he's seated at the right hand of the Father, and uh, the Father has given him the Spirit, and he, the Messiah, has poured it out on his people. And that's what you see in here. So uh, I think the kingdom has begun, but in an unexpected form. And uh, that's what the extra handout I gave you about the kingdom parables here, is that uh, in the first coming we see the suffering Messiah's teachings, uh, and then he initiates an unexpected present form of the kingdom, but then he returns, and then the reigning Messiah, the teachings about that, we get the expected form. And the kingdom parables in uh, Matthew 13 and Mark 4 uh, contrast the expected and the unexpected form. And uh, they are really different. They are really different. Uh, just looking at the first one, the, the sower, the parable of the sower. What's the expected form? Well, Messiah comes and he turns Israel and all the nations to himself. And it is, uh, it is powerful as the day of the Lord has begun. This is what John the Baptist said Messiah was going to do. And uh, there's no kind of wondering, you know, what are you going to do this way or that? It's very clear. He, he is coming in uh, uh, overwhelming power and, and majesty and glory. But Jesus said, actually, the unexpected form is uh, it's, uh, people will respond in different ways uh, with the, the word of the kingdom that is sown. And there's at least four different responses to it. And uh, wow, that's very different from the king coming in overwhelming power and majesty, isn't it? And, and on and on and on and on. So uh, uh, unexpected uh, as to how this is going to come about. And uh, my understanding is, though, all the expected, anticipated Old, Old Testament prophecies simply get moved then to his return when we will see those in uh, uh, his full glory. So. So the kingdom of God is an issue, obviously, that runs all throughout the Old Testament and uh, area that uh, great theological systems uh, differ a bit on that. And there's even a little bit of difference between uh, our faculty, between uh, those who are more traditional dispensationalists, classic dispensationalists, I guess, and those of us who are progressive dispensationalists. So, but we like progressive better than pinko or some kind of a you know, negative term like that. <laughs> You know, it's like we've left the faith because we've kind of modified a little bit. Okay, let's look at, at Matthew um, 23. Um, we left off at uh, verse 8 where he said uh, they like being called rabbi in the marketplace. Verse 8, but do not be called rabbi for one is your teacher and you are all brothers. Hmm. And do not call anyone on earth your father for one is your father. He is in heaven. And do not be called leaders, and we'll talk about that a little more, for one is your leader, that is Messiah, Christ. But the greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Wow, okay. Interesting passage about religious titles, isn't it? Okay, notice the context. Uh, Two problems with using the term rabbi for people. 
One is that it seems to usurp the teaching of God, and it's that through the Messiah, through the Spirit, there's that. And the second is it seems to introduce a hierarchy that militates against being brothers and sisters. Uh, to, to introduce that terminology introduces an inappropriate hierarchy. So two, two problems with that. And uh, with father, it's the second one, verse 9, is that it seems to uh, usurp upon our father, heavenly father's role, uh, if we use a religious title like father. And the third one, this, this one's a little harder. Do not be called leaders, for one's your leader, that is Christ. This, this term is not the typical term for leader that is used in the New Testament for, for elders, pastors, overseers, and uh, the gift of, of leadership. It is a different term. And it has a field of meaning. It could mean teachers, mentors, guides, masters, leaders, those who show the way spiritually. And it's in the plural. Um, and do not call anyone on, uh, oops, verse 10, and do not be called leaders or teachers or mentors or guides or masters or those who show the way spiritually. But uh, one, for one is your, all these terms in the singular now, that is Messiah. So uh, I just want to be suggestive on this because I'm still kind of wrestling with this. But if he's emphasizing teachers again, it's kind of redundant with verse 8, isn't it? With rabbi. But if he's uh, emphasizing, uh, and again, it's a different word normally used for leaders, and, and we do have leadership in the church, don't we, in other passages. Uh, now, it's under Jesus' leadership, so it could be emphasizing leaders here, but it seems like, and there are some who have uh, argued this, it's more the idea of mentors, guides, and, and masters, or disciplers, if you will. And uh, if that's what it's getting at, then y y we might want to rethink some of our terminology and how we view, for example, discipleship. Um, I learned it this way. In the parachurch ministry I was in that uh, somebody discipled me and then I discipled somebody else and then they discipled that. Uh, and we were mentors or guides or, you know, these sorts of things uh, to other people. And uh, it's interesting that terminology is not used in the New Testament, but rather pure terminology is used, for example, by Paul. And I think that's because Jesus is... For all of us, he is our mentor, he is our spiritual guide, if you will, he is uh, our master who spiritually informs us and in all of this. And so this may be getting at that, that I haven't talked about discipling anybody for 30 some years, because I don't make disciples of me, Jesus makes disciples of him. <laughs> And in that process of helping his disciples, my relationship to, the, to these people is as a fellow disciple. Because Jesus is discipling me, Jesus is discipling them. And so this passage may be getting at that. Again, it's kind of a term with a field of meaning. And uh, if that's what it's getting at, the New Testament seems to undergird that. So we want to be careful with religious terminology. It can usurp uh, the Father's or the Son's role or the Spirit's role and it could create inappropriate hierarchies uh, among God's people. We want to be careful of that. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.